Hello friends, a very good evening to all of you. For few, it might be good morning as well. And uh, once again, your host Piali is here with a new topic and a new speaker with us. Today we have uh, Jay Goldstein with us from Chicago. Jay is an enterprise scrum trainer and a professor of agile leadership. And today, Jay will tell us about his uh, University of Chicago course, the five shifts from traditional management to agile leadership. Over to you, Jay. Oh, thank you, Piali. I'm going to take a look at the, the systems at a very high view. And um, for all of you that are involved in, um, in really bringing um, Agile to the entire organization, um, I hope this will be helpful for you. And there's been a lot of talk. You, you've probably heard about mindset and how important mindset is. And that's a lot of what this presentation is about. Um, just to give you a little background, um, I, I had the opportunity to get my MBA uh, in 2003, which was not too long after the signing of the Agile Manifesto. At the time, my program was rated one of the, the best ones in the world. And I can tell you that I heard nothing about Agile uh, Scrum or anything in um, in in the two years I was in that program and the 33 courses I took. So um, what happened is, uh, and I've mostly been in electronics and been an entrepreneur uh, and and adopted many of the principles of agility, but had not been exposed to them. And so what happened, I was helping a friend uh, scale his software company about six years ago, and I got um, introduced and we did an agile transformation. And um, I've just been so devoted to uh, to this this world since I had to go back to school, so to speak, uh, uh, and and get I've uh, gotten ten certifications since then. Um, but it's it, it's become um, quite a trend. And uh, just to give you you know some background, in case you're you're not seeing it globally, um, these are just some of the uh, companies, some of the logos uh, that are committed to uh, very broad agile transformations and of course we expect to see the software companies on there the Spotify's and Amazon's Google's whatnot Microsoft but um, we see you know the hardware companies we see you know BMW is built on scrum um, some of the large tractor equipment companies uh, in the US Caterpillar and John Deere Saab aircraft and um, and the banks are making a big move this way recently a, a bank, um, the largest bank in Australia and New Zealand, ANZ, um, has announced uh, by their CEO that they're going to take an ax to the bank's hierarchies and bureaucracy and shift the entire workforce to agile teams. You know, they want to get the benefits of these, these software uh, companies, the Facebook, Spotify's. And he goes on to say that um, this radically changes the way basically everything's done, assign work, fun work, manage things, what you measure, and it's it's quite a shift for folks that uh, that have come from a traditional space. McKinsey just last week came out with a survey that um, showed that 37% uh, of the companies are, are in the process of an agile transformation, um, and four or more uh, percent have completed it. So 41% either in or completed transformation. So we're getting very broad. I, I like to look at Harvard. Business Review, uh, sort of the uh, the leading business management publication, uh, and they even finally came out with an article. It's a very good article if you want to help your fellow managers understand agility. Written by um, Jeff Sutherland, uh, the co-inventor of Scrum, and I believe that uh, the MBA really uh, needs to shift to this point. Uh, maybe you can let me know um, in the chat. Uh, or in the uh, discussion stream later, if you know of a university yet that has started a track that that's the, really a 21st century um, MBA, I think should be called the Masters in Business Agility. Uh, administration, of course, being an artifact of traditional management. So a little while ago, I had the opportunity to, um, to gather nine companies um, and we acted as a cohort and we traveled around the world to each other's businesses. I helped facilitate this with Steve Denning. This is us in front of our visit to Microsoft. Uh, prior to uh, the rest of the day, I would never have thought Microsoft had anything uh, like Agile going on. We were 
very pleasantly surprised. And we published our, um, our findings. You can find that on my LinkedIn. We can post that later. But this is what I concluded after seeing what's really going on out there. Uh, when you see how it's happening at scale, um, and we were, you know, Microsoft has about four and a half thousand people operating this way, Ericsson, a couple of thousand. It's, it can be so amazing and beautiful. It's so efficacious and humanizing. I began to wonder, why doesn't everyone organize their entire companies in this manner? I mean, what rational leader, what manager would want to even consider any other such approach in today's economy? And what our paper concluded, um, and this gets to the mindset uh, issue, is that a universal feature of all of these site visits, these nine site visits, was a recognition that achieving the benefits, the agile benefits, dependent on the requisite leadership mindset, where the management practices and methodologies were implemented without the mindset, that no substantial benefits were observed. This is the you know discussion we have about if we just put in the tools, right, of Scrum or something. Individually, none of the observed management practices are new. Actually, all of these components we discuss have been around for some time, even in, in Scrum and Agile. What's new is the way that they've kind of come together and they constitute a coherent and integrated system. And, it, and that system is driven by and it's lubricated by a common uh, and very similar set of leadership mindsets. So what I want to take a look at is what are those leadership mindsets? But before we get into an Agile leadership, we really need to take a quick look at, uh, at, at the, and these are the five shifts, the goal, the role, the coordination, the value, and the, the method of communication. But let's take a quick look at traditional management because we need to understand, you know, we, we all are beneficiaries. We stand here today on the shoulders of the benefits of hierarchical bureaucracy. I mean, it helped, um, meet the demands for mass market products and services, and, and it generated a lot of the world that we have today, but the world's changed, right? I mean, now with globalization and deregulation and particularly the shift with the internet of the power from the, um, from the producer to the consumer, uh, these methods of management that have been around for a hundred years, scientific management, Taylorism, um, they're no longer adequate for the task at hand. So what constitutes traditional management really quickly? Well, starting with the goal, the primary focus is primarily maximizing shareholder value. And this idea came out in the 70s. Uh, I, I can blame it on a, a university a professor that uh, where I actually teach now, Milton Friedman, he was credited with this. Um, in his um, article in, in 1970 called The Social Responsibility of Businesses to Increase Its Profits. This idea that if we focus on maximizing shareholder value, we'll actually get these other benefits did not turn out to be the case. So what's the role then in traditional management of the manager or of the leader? So this goal of maximizing shareholder value it, it's not that inspiring. It's not that engaging. And so, um, and so there's this unholy alliance where we, we, need to, we need to create a structure where people will work in that environment. And so we have this command and control. And that's the manager's job is to carry out, you know, the, the higher, higher ups um, plans and, and, and uh, activities. And then the leader, we developed somehow in traditional management this idea of this charismatic goal scoring superstar, right? Who kind of carries everybody on their back. Um, and they use the power of the position, that positional power, to take unilateral decisions. And they may even believe that they're in that position because they have superior or expert knowledge. Well, how is it coordinated in traditional management? If I ask you to go to you know, the whiteboard or the chalkboard and draw out your organization. I hope it doesn't look like this, but most cases it probably still does. It's an org chart, right? Uh, what I call the geometry of traditional management, which are polygons stacked on polygons, you know, people reporting up to people. This is the typical method for coordinating. And what are some of the underlying values um, in traditional management? 
well, mechanistic, right? Because this derives from an era of the, the mass production line, the, the, and Henry Ford credited with helping invent that, put it perfectly. He says, why is it that every time I ask for a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached? I mean, if that isn't a picture of the opposite of the knowledge uh, economy, you know, that's, that's, that was the mentality in traditional management. And I like to think of it, so Guy Kawasaki is a writer. I uh, wrote Enchantment, he talks about eaters. Um, he says, don't be an eater, you know, and this is a view of the world uh, out of scarcity, you know, that, there, that there's only so much to go around, it's, it's scarce. And so I'm going to get the most out of my, the, the, that's out there. There's only so much to go around. It's a, it's a win-lose, right? And people are, we, you hear it in our language sometimes, we, we call people resources instead of humans, right? We call customers targets, and it's about cost you know, efficiency, cost reduction, and um, and short-term quarterly or next next uh, term gains, very short-term views. And the communication, naturally, as we've suggested, is top-down, and it's structured, um, and uh, and there's not as much, nearly as much opportunity as we experience in agility. So that's a very very quick overview of traditional. I just wanted to put our our head around that. So we understand and appreciate that this is a system, and it's a system that has interlocking uh, beliefs, behaviors, activities. And in order to shift from a system like that, we have to take a full systems approach. And it is not a um, small shift. But we have lots of reasons to make the shift. Think of the downsides now, today, of traditional management. And there's a growing chorus of discontent. I mean, even from very traditional managers, folks like Jack Welsh now say things like this idea of maximizing shareholder value is actually the dumbest idea in the world. I mean, these, these are worldwide business leaders that are now joining in the chorus. You see here, Jack Ma, customers are number one, pro employees number two, shareholders number three. So reversing sort of the order. And um, Salesforce is often held up as an example. Uh, and Mark Benioff, and he says this whole idea of share, maximizing shareholder value, it's not about creating profits for shareholders, it's about improving the state of the world. But we have systemic problems, um, and, and particularly in, in the US, um, CEO pay is now highly derived from stock benefits. This wasn't even legal before the 80s. And so the incentives of the executives um, don't always line up with with all of the stakeholders. So uh, Gary Hamill, who uh, is, is a Wall Street Journal number one business thought leader, um, he says it's very expensive, this bureaucracy. In fact, he says it costs just the US $3 trillion a year. Um, and you can see the growth in the managerial class over other, uh, uh, other classes of, uh, of workers. And just to put $3 trillion in perspective, we recently had some natural disasters. Um, you may have heard about in the US and uh, they're just a fraction, very, very expensive, just a fraction of the cost of, of something like $3 trillion. So an enormous amount of waste in, um, in this bureaucracy. Um, it's uncreative. Uh, it's, it's allergic to control. Uh, uh, control, I should say, is allergic to creativity. Um, I was talking to a management consulting friend the other day that forgot that um, I had helped get Redbox going, which is this kiosk uh, rental business that uh, put, helped put out of business the, uh, the retail uh, movie rental stores. And um, he said, well, my goal with my clients is, um, is to, uh, to keep them from getting Redboxed. I'd never heard Redbox being used as a verb before. I liked it since I've, I've been involved with them. Yes, it's, it's um, high record bureaucracy does not help um, prepare for disruptive innovation. It's too slow as well. We see that, look at the change in, um, in where profits derive from. You can think of your own organizations. New products and new services today, ones that were introduced in the last five years, they account for 70% of the profits. It was, they were only 20% of the profits uh, um, a number of years ago. So quite a shift in how quickly things 
happen. I mentioned being engaged as well. We have only one in five workers fully engaged according to Deloitte. And uh, the Gallup poll even says that about 15% of workers are actively disengaged, which means that while they're working for your company or for my company, they're actually sabotaging the company they work for. So very uh, uh, big problem with disengagement with traditional management. It's unsustainable. This is return on assets, uh, which has been shrinking and it's not survivable. We see in the stock markets, for example, companies used to last up to 60 years. The average of lifespan uh, a public company is moving down. It's about 12 years now. Lots of downsides to traditional management. But as I was mentioning, the shift is no small shift. And I want to, before we look at, at the characteristics, the different characteristics of agile leadership, I want you to appreciate what a shift this is. In fact, somebody, some people have called it, Steve Denning, and, and I'm now calling this a Copernican revolution in management, that we're dealing with a completely different paradigm. You might remember uh, from your history of science that um, you know, up to uh, about 1500, um, people believed the predominant view was that uh, everything revolved around the earth, right? Uh, the Ptolemaic system. So the sun and the stars and everything revolved around the earth. And we can see in traditional management, a very similar uh, perspective that the customer revolved around the firm. The firm controlled the production, the firm controlled the messaging. And, um, and in the Copernican system, you recall the world we know of today is that actually the earth uh, is not the center of the universe. Uh, the sun and, and uh, revolves, the earth revolves around the sun and on and on. And so we see this now in today's modern and agile firms that they've made the shift to understanding that the firm needs to revolve around the customers and the users. Um, and to do this part way is actually uh, worse than doing it at all. Um, some of you may know Craig Larman and his work with, with Les. Um, I asked him, I said, how do you uh, handle people when they first call you and they're interested in transformation services? And he said, uh, he said well, he says, the first call, um, I say to them, no, you really don't want to do this. And I hang up on them. And that's how one of the leading thought leaders begins his engagements. Because unless there is a true commitment in the organization, um, you're better off not even starting. This is not like ISO 9000 and other business improvement projects. Uh, Jurgen Eplow talks about this in Management 2.0. I do believe it's the true paradigm shift. Um, we can relate it to the person that sort of uh, thought about that initially, Thomas Kuhn, in uh, his book, Structures of Scientific Revolutions. He says, though the world does not change with the change of a paradigm, afterward, we work in a different world. It's, it's when we put these new glasses on, uh, we see the world differently. And as uh, ANZ mentioned, everything changes. Here's another um, executive quote. It affects everything in the organization, the way you manage. The game has changed radically and we looked at this earlier um, you could look at uh, uh, at Satya Nadella's um, work at Microsoft um, this is the October issue of Fast Company you can get it online I really recommend you read the article or get um, his book um, his new book but he he was deeply influenced by uh, Carol Dweck's book Mindset shifting people from being a know-it-all organization to being a learn-it-all learn it all organization. And uh, it's been a tremendous shift to Microsoft, and he's credited now with adding $250 billion of market value, but quite a cultural change. So a shift in mindsets. So do not take the uh, transition, the transformation lightly. I think it's one, one of the mistakes we've been making is thinking that we can introduce Agile and it will somehow um, by like a virus, um, capture the whole organization. And it, it certainly works that way to some degree, but we do run up against this resistance of this original system and the original system needs to be addressed and addressed um, thoroughly. So let's look at the shifts and the time we have, we're gonna leave some, uh, hopefully plenty of time for questions at the end here and, and get to some of your, your best um, thoughts and questions. So the goal shifts from maximizing shareholder value to delighting 
customers, delighting clients. Again, not a new concept. Peter Drucker is considered the guru, the father of modern management theory and practice. And he said in the 50s, the only valid purpose of a firm is to create a customer, not to, 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 to make a value in stock. Uh, and, uh, but, um, but it's really more than that today, not just creating a customer, but delighting. And, and it's delight as perceived by the customer. They are the source of truth. They're the ultimate source of truth. They are the true north. We turn to them. We interact with them. And it's not a one a goal among many. It's actually the only goal. Um, John Kay, an economist, wrote a book called Obliquity. He talks about this principle that um, there are some goals that we cannot achieve by going directly at them. He would suggest even happiness is one of those things. It's a byproduct. It's an outcome of doing other things. We delight clients and we get these other benefits. Guy Kawasaki, I mentioned before, he talks about the purpose of, 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 firm, of a firm is to create meaning. And he says companies that start out to, um, to only create profit uh, will create, uh, likely not create meaning or create profit. But if we start out with the right goal, we end up with with creating delighted customers and profit can flow from that for those for-profit companies, other outcomes for nonprofits and these other benefits. We get engaged folks, we get increased quality, et cetera. Well, you might ask, we know how to measure profit, right? We, we've been doing that for a long time, but um, client delight, that's kind of uh, soft maybe. You think maybe we can't measure it. Well, actually, Fred Reicheld came out came up uh, some time ago with this idea of a net promoter score. You may have experienced it already. It's commonly used if your company's not doing it. It's a very simple thing to implement. Um, we do it after our trainings. Maybe you folks do as well. And uh, it's simply, you know, would you recommend, for example, this, this training to a, a friend or colleague? How likely are you to recommend it on a scale of one to 10? Um, it's tough. It's a tough scale. It goes from minus 100 to plus 100. Um, uh, Google scores only about a 15. The Apple iPhone is very high <clears throat> in Apple at about 65 or 70. Tough, tough scale, but a great one and a very, very quick. You get about 80% of everything you need to know from, from that. Uh, so we can um, uh, learn, uh, get a lot from, from just that simple goal. Let's look at the role. Uh, the role of the manager moves from controlling to enabling. And this is where we get the language we use in agility of a coach, right? A coach instead of a manager. Um, or uh, some time ago, this concept of a servant leader came out. So again, it's not a new concept, but we're integrating it in this, this system of agility. And, uh, and, and so from an enabler, what are you enabling? Well, primarily you're working to enable self-organizing teams, right? This is what some people describe as complex adaptive as in nature. We look at the, the way these um, certain animals just manage to have these very complex uh, but self-organizing uh, a, a way of operating, very efficient, very effective. And, uh, but not merely just self-organizing. Our role as agile coaches and leaders is to cultivate high-performing teams, high-performing self-organizing teams. Um, a lot of this work here and some of you get to meet uh, Peter Stevens as well, and is derived from our friend Steve Denning, who wrote Radical Management, and I recommend that um, to a lot of folks. And he writes that if you set up the conditions right, and this I believe is our, our goal as, as coaches and agile leaders, self-organizing uh, teams will normally evolve into high-performing teams. Now, there's a number of characteristics. We spend more time on this in, in the two-day course. But uh, these are some of the characteristics of, of what it takes to set up these conditions, right? We have to have a high trust environment and um, cross-functional teams. We want people to move into uh, flow, so feel safe, you know, cognitively diverse teams and things like that. So that's the, our role. Our role is, is enablers. Um, the way we coordinate, you are familiar already, it's, it's by collaborating, right? We're, we're, that's quite different from hierarchical bureaucracy. Let me just take a minute and, and, and give some background. Why, why do we do this collaboration? Why does this work so well? 
Let's, again, it gets back to we're in a different world now. What kind of problems are we facing to delight customers, to, to innovate? Well, I, I would suggest, and others would say, it's a wicked problem. It's really a tough, tough thing to do. Um, and one of the evidence of this is um, you can look at research that's done on, for example, why, um, how, how, uh, what percentage of new consumer product goods products um, succeed or, or how many fail. Um, this, these are just some of the brands, for example, from Procter Gamble, which happened to be formed uh, 180 years ago today. Um, $65 billion company. They certainly can afford all of the best customer research and focus groups. They can hire the smartest marketing folks from the best schools. And yet, and I'd love it if we could have taken a survey and get your answer. If you have a guess in your mind, um, the answer is only 3%, 3% of products succeed. And that's from the very brightest. So we're dealing with, uh, some of you may have seen the Kinevin model for sense making. We're dealing with this upper left quadrant of complexity in the world today. We're trying to solve for complex problems. And what we found, what history has always shown is that teams do this. So I like to consider it this way, and you can share this easily with, with folks, just draw a circle on the board. Consider this, consider the orange circle in the middle is everything you need to know to do your project, to, do, to build your product, to even to um, run your, your business, to grow your company. Um, the blue slice I would suggest is what you already know, what the, what the people in your organization already know. You have that knowledge. The green slice is what you know that you do not know, right? So that's typically the realm that we get uh, an expert. And this is what I describe as the, as the proposition value of an MBA up to this point, is that you've become an expert in a particular area and then you hire out, out your expertise to solve these. But, but these are for known problems. These are, these are for complicated problems in the Kinevin model. But complex problems, it's been shown by research and uh, by practice that they're always best solved by self-organizing teams. The way that Steve Denning puts it is that a complex problem like discovering ways to delight, delight clients is best solved by a cognitively diverse group of people that's given the responsibility for solving the problem, self-organizes and works together to solve it. That's, that's, that's kind of a key thesis for us in agility and the reason why. Um, and now we know enough about um, collaboration. Of course, you're familiar, many of you with, the, um, with Scrum, which is one of the leading frameworks. And uh, we know enough now you can provide good uh, data, uh, maybe to reluctant managers, that um, it works, you know, about three times better on projects, for example, than Waterfall from the Standish group. I like to suggest that, um, you know, the org chart is no longer the model. Um, really, the geometry, uh, if you want to wrap your head around this, is fractal. And at fractal, you know that um, that it has the self-similar. It's the, it's the geometry of nature, right? That was the key. Uh, Mandelbrot it, uh, discovered or invented in the 1950s, considered one of the great new branches, like on the order of calculus. And at every level, you see the self-similarity, right? And so in Agile, you can see this, for example, we can just look at um, backlogs, right? We have, we have at a, a wider scale, uh, uh, we have a, a product backlog. We can even have a wider scale than that and have a company. Uh, then we can go, you know, drill down. We can see a very similar pattern and a release backlog and a very similar pattern if we drill down even further into our our uh, sprint or iteration backlogs. And this can be, we can look at teams the same way. Um, so think about how different the world is today. We're in, a, we're in these network organizations. Uh, this is from Apple, um, how many uh, developers they now have. Uh, 13 million as of uh, last year on the Worldwide Developer Conference. How could we do traditional management uh, with 13 million employees, 13 million developers. You know, imagine the, the annual reviews. It, it would take more than all year to get through them. 
yet we would not have, um, you know, the mobile environment today, Android, iOS environments today, if it weren't for this tremendous network of collaborating folks. So not only internal collaboration, not only collaboration at the team level or, or the at, at company level, but really we're, this is what's operating at, uh, at, at a wider level. And, and we can see how that works. So collaborate, coordination uh, through collaboration, really one of the key principles in agile leadership. Let's look at the underlying values. Instead of you know a win-lose um, where we have to uh, be exploitative, um, we have this value infrastructure, this architecture for agility. Uh, the values, I like to use the five scrum values, for example. Um, they, um, they're the least, they're the things that we really should be our foundation that are, are, are immutable. Principles, you know, you could look at the Agile Manifesto principles, you can look at Steve Denning's seven principles in, in radical management. We, they, they're more flexible, but they, re, they build upon the values, they reinforce the values. And then our practices, as long as our practices can um, support the principles and the values, we could do quite a, quite a variety of things. It doesn't have to just look like Scrum. And so uh, to use Kai, Kai, Guy Kawasaki's uh, terms, our value, our attitude changed from being uh, eaters to bakers. We can just make more. When we collaborate, the sum is greater uh, than uh, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And, and, and there's more than enough to go around. We'll just make more pie. So it comes from a view of abundance. So lastly and quickly, uh, we'll get to your questions. Communication changes, right? It's not top down, it's not structured. Um, and this is why we, we have all of these, uh, for example, visual facili facilitation, these information radiators we use um, during the learning consortium. We uh, went to Magna International as one of our visits who has uh, one of the large uh, automotive manufacturers in the world. and. Um, they implemented lean and virtually every wall had had uh, the printed out reports you could have an impromptu meeting anywhere great implementation even the um, interior design may change at Microsoft for example they went through two iterations they initially had this you know open floor plan that was made very popular um, by the Japanese model and uh, so they went from the cubicles and the managers being on the outside of the window and they wiped all of that out. They reorganized, they went wide open. And, uh, but then they found out that um, people wouldn't communicate as much because it was so quiet. Um, people could overhear you talking. They, they said it would invoke what they call the library effect where people would whisper or not talk at all. And so they went to these beautiful team rooms They completely redesigned. Um, this is for the um, team foundation, um, the, the uh, developer division about four to four and a half thousand people. So they have about three buildings, campus. They completely redesigned and went to these team rooms. Each team room has an outside window, um, has a central area, and then has some additional smaller rooms for ad hoc meetings, the different size rooms. Uh, I walked out of there, um, I could not believe, I, I, would, I would love to work. I mean, it's, it's amazing what's the transformation. Agile leaders learn other um, communication techniques like telling stories. Uh, Steve Denning writes quite a bit about this and does uh, workshops on it. He says, carry the attitude, I've got a spark. You know, you have some ideas, I have some ideas. Let's build a fire together. Let's, let's, and so ancient times, people have always told by narration. So build some stories up, some success stories, tell the human stories of the agile transformation that'll help get people along. You may have heard of Gemba walks, for example. It's another communication technique. For, for managers and leaders, uh, go to the actual place, walk around, uh, but not in the for the purposes of trying to control um, or or you know observe um, for management traditional management purposes, but to have an attitude of of uh, to be taught or to share, to teach, to coach, to learn, and observe what's actually going on, not what management wants to present. Uh, this was amazing, um, he, again, from that article uh, from Satya Nadella. His first act after becoming CEO in February 14 was to ask the company's top executives to read Marshall Rosenberg's book, um, who 
which I've delighted in many years, I was exposed to actually back in college, nonviolent communication. It's a stunning um, statement uh, of the direction he wanted to take Microsoft right from the start of his cultural change, um, completely changing the way people talk with each other. So we can see communication being very key to one of the, the five shifts. It's really, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let, let, you, uh, um, let you get to your questions now. Um, uh, Piali, thanks so much for the opportunity to present. This is some of my contact information, but particularly we'll post this. This tiny URL is actually the link to this very presentation. Uh, and then you can even drill down if you want, and you can look at uh, some of the books that um, are uh, referenced in, in here for your, your further reading. So Piali, I'll turn it over to you. I hope we have some time left. Yeah, we have uh, time left, around 20 minutes we have. Just let me check Wonderful. if we have some questions. Yeah, uh, the first question we have, uh, how are human resource getting aligned while leadership are embracing agile journey? What are your thoughts around this? Right, that's a, that's a great question as well. Um, you know, human, I, human resource, I've, I've been joking, is a, is a great contradiction of terms, right? So, um, sort of a oxymoron. We're talking about humans, but then we're referring to them as resources. Um, some some of the agile transformation is actually coming through uh, HR. So um, there is there isn't a good answer to this yet uh, of a a particular practice that that we can go to that's modeling how HR can support um, and uh, and and we can actually look at a number of functions uh, if you're still in a um, in in a hierarchical organization that is departmental where you know for example you have HR you have um, you have marketing you have sales you know you have admin um, in enterprise scrum uh, it, for organizations that are really going agile what we look is is actually sort of breaking up what one consultant friend of mine says the concrete in these traditional organizations and really reorganizing around customer outcomes you can a and Z for example is is reorganizing around customer outcomes and so Instead of having central services, you might have a much smaller central service um, in HR, and you'll have some of those functions actually move to the business units, and those business units will be um, will be cross-functional. So all of the functions of the large company that were very departmental will be will be driven down, and will be collab. They'll be collaborating within a unit. Um, could be around a product uh, group. Could be around a customer group. It could be around a, a um, a business unit, and uh, but it's it's a tough question. Um, so we we got to visit Riot Games, um, which is uh, unbelievable culture uh, in Santa Monica. You know they do the League of Legends game, seventy hundred million concurrent annual uh, monthly users, and they filter very carefully for their employee quality uh, to fit their culture. And yet they still admit that in some areas, in, in, in the administrative areas like HR, um, they have not been able um, to fully uh, bring aboard um, an agile mentality. And so they're actually reworking that a little bit. I think eventually we're going to have uh, CSM classes <laughs> all the way across the board. We're gonna have uh, Scrum for sales, Scrum for HR, Scrum. You know, we will be teaching agility in all of these. I mean, you see, like for Maria Martorelli, that's teaching us for marketing. I hope it answers it, Piali. Yeah, I'm going to the uh, next question. Uh, what are the ideal groundwork should be done while doing agile transformation? Um, would this be, for example, before, uh, sort of in the preparation, the groundwork? I presume groundwork means preparation. Um, I think we could look at some interesting models. Um, I do like uh, Craig Larman with with Les. He he has a um, he 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 ensures that there is uh, sponsorship at the executive level. Um, one of the patterns that we saw in the learning consortium that where we where these companies were successful, I saw this at Ericsson, I saw this at Microsoft, is a strong and knowledgeable um, executive sponsor. At the division at Ericsson, it was the person running the division. 
um, that whole unit. Uh, same thing for the developer division, uh, Brian Harry at, um, at, at Microsoft. Um, and underneath was, was an agile lead. Um, Aaron Bjork it was it is that role at, at Microsoft and who's who's leading helping lead the implementation so we see this pattern of ensuring there's a agile agile sponsor an executive sponsor and an agile lead and a spot because you know there's some experiments are going to occur and some of them aren't going to have the perfect outcomes in the transformation that that everybody you know wants they're learning you're learning how to adopt it right and and so the executive sponsor needs to provide that cover, um, that defense against the rest of the organization to ensure that those experiments can occur and they can be adopted. And, and this is similar to what um, Craig uh, does for less as well. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question. How to change mind shift for managers from command control to enabler? <laughs> that's that's uh, that's a million dollar question. I'm actually looking at developing a, an intensive experiential workshop uh, for managers that want to do that. Um, the head of Ericsson told a story uh, that I think is 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 um, is emblematic of this, it's, and that uh, he was given the responsibility to go do the agile transformation at this unit. I think it had about three thousand people. Um, he called up a, a lead of another division that had successfully done it. He asked him, he said, can you just give me the manual? Tell me how to do this. I'll get on with it. Um, that that uh, executive said, it doesn't work that way. And, he, and uh, he says, what do you mean it doesn't work that way? Just tell, give me the manual. He goes, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you a coach um, and you're going to work with the coach. For eight months, the leader of, uh, of this Ericsson unit worked with that coach. In the beginning, when he began to offer suggestions, about what they needed to do for the agile transformation, his mindset was still in the traditional management. And the coach would say, uh, well, that's actually, you don't wanna do that. And he would then you know, spend some time and he'd, he'd, he'd talk and he'd, he'd read about it. And he came back and he'd say to the coach, well, we need to do this, this, and this, right? And the coach would say, well, that's actually the, the last thing you wanna do. It took him eight months, finally went on vacation, he took some books and he had an aha experience. I believe we can do better. I believe we can help reduce. He, you know, he was willing, he was studying, he, he desired to get it, and still, and he was very bright, he was executive, well, you know, and, and yet um, it took him eight months. So this is not a small, this is not a small problem. So um, there, there are some techniques, but uh, I, think, I think you're gonna see over the next few years a lot of improvement in our Agile community and bringing awareness uh, to these two uh, managers, how to really bring them through the, the mind, mind shift. Thanks. Okay, uh, next question we have. Performance appraisals always focuses on the individual capability and deliveries, whereas Agile and Scrum advocates for the team deliveries, how to tackle uh, such mental blocks in the organizations? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a perfect example of where um, you have these structures, these systems, you know, often coming from HR's uh, manuals, right, um, to do uh, individual um, reviews. So, um, I, I, again, I'm not sure how to do the mind shift, but uh, I do believe that a good coach and a good uh, a product owner um, can provide uh, some boundaries um, and some pushback to the organization in educating the organization that these, that these kinds of uh, methods do not reinforce what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so moving, it's not just difficult at the, at the HR level. It's let's, we, you know, those of us have done this for a while, you know, it's difficult even at the team. Like when a person joins a team, they have to move, you know, from being an individual, from, from being rewarded and thinking themselves of themselves as an individual performer to being a collaborator, a collaborator um, whereby it's the outcome, the collective outcome, the outcome of the team that is what matters. And so, again, I think, you, you know, you've got to look for uh, management, executive sponsorship, and, uh, and you have to work with the team to get them on board that, that they're actually, you know, uh, going to be rewarded for the team output 
uh, that they're in it together um, or on this boat together, right? Sink or uh, sail or sink together and um, and then begin to see the rewards and the benefits that, that accrue from that. Many transformations take many, many years. You know, all of these took these large ones at Adobe and, 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 and Microsoft went to many, many years. They started with a small group that conducted themselves well and, and attracted others and attracted others. So hopefully you get some momentum and then you could begin to uh, change some of the, the overarching policies. Uh, well, we have another Jay in this session who is asking this question. Uh, he's asking uh, managers play a dual role of one is a PM keeping team members happy and other is agilist keeping customers happy. So would you please uh, suggest some reference books to manage this dual role at workplace? Um, well, for I, well, I do like um, uh, Steve Dunning's radical management to get a kind of a view of this, but he, he talks about this virtual cycle, this virtuous reinforcing cycle, and this is what we want happening in our in our agile systems, right? That um, when when team members have the line of sight to the to the the beneficiary of their work, usually the client. Uh, the or the customer when they when they are they when they are connected so you know we, we think about our um, our, our product reviews our uh, you know end of sprint demos and whatnot when when the there are representatives in there um, that are the users um, the team members feel like they're working on meaningful work right because they see that it has an impact and improving the lives of others and this is this is what motivates us as humans and and so I think we, we begin a virtuous cycle when we connect the team members and the people that are benefiting from their work. So see if there are maybe better ways that you can improve that line of sight. And I think you'll see the engagement and the, and the customer benefit uh, working together, if, if that helps. Uh, well, next question we have, uh, how do we approach agile implementation if the middle management is more traditional, although the organization leader is fully supportive of agile? Um, can you say that again? Yeah, sure. How do we approach agile implementation if the middle management is more traditional, Although the organization leader is fully supportive of Agile. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, the, um, so what Les does is it creates a role, and, 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 um, and some others do things like this as well, for what they call a line manager, um, which, which is a traditional manager that has... Um, a line of sight between the large organization and the team and, and, and product uh, owners. And so there, that's one way, you know, I, I mean, I do think we have to be conscious that people's roles are, are going to change as, as A and Z, for example, and others have, have su suggested. Um, and so um, the role main, the role as it was, as it was before, just may not, be needed and may not exist in an, in an agile transformation. And so I do think there has to be some care taken in thinking through what some new roles might be. And um, you might see someone, you know, move towards more towards a product owner kind of team role or a coach type role, or they may um, keep some traditional sort of middle manager role, but in this new world. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a good question. It's a case by case. Uh, but again, I think um, you're hitting the right notes. These are the things that need to be addressed. Yeah, next question we have, uh, how can we know project given is uh, suitable for Agile? Uh, that's, that's a, yeah, so there's a lot of, you know, discussion. Are there things that uh, don't benefit from Agility? And where I fall on that, is um is getting back to that that kind of Kinevin chart that I showed or or the kind of work that 
that we're doing. If it's if it's complex work, we definitely want to be working in a team and working with agility. If it's something where there we've established some known um, some some known processes for that um, for for that are repeated um, that that might that might not look as much like an agile development team right however um, developing that process uh, and reviewing that process and improving that process that's all agile work so some of the work may be conducted that that's just an outcome of of what have been in the internal operations that have designed and developed, um, but um, but again, I think if we keep this overarching sort of view that we're learning, we're improving. You know, you can look at just going back to the Toyota production system, right? Um, this is this is kind of the 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 basis of that 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 we can pull that that and on cord anytime, right? Even if we're working on a production line, we can pull that that cord. If there's any quality issue, we'll be rewarded for doing that. And these are the, these are part of the, the you know the attitude and the continuous improvement that that really will make our companies competitive. Moving on to the next question. Uh, next, we have uh, how to address the resistance in the change. Yeah, probably we need to get more specific about where that resistance is coming from. I think we've had some really good questions um, about resistance at the executive level and resistance at the, the manager level um, and uh, um, you know it's it's you really sort of have to assess the level of resistance in the organization as it is and how much um, how much can be accomplished today from your role um, but but I, I would not minimize anybody's role I mean it's been astounding the the courage and um, the 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 capabilities of folks like uh, like Peter Green started he went on he went to one CSM training um, I forget who with uh, I think one of the one of the old timers and he, he came back to Adobe and he said I want to do this he was this is like nine eight years ago at this point and he just started his team and I I credit him with saving Adobe today because eventually the entire company transformed this way and they were i mean i don't know if any of you remember what the days were like eight ten years ago trying to get um adobe reader updates and the security flaws and you know they didn't have the creative cloud it was local and there was licensing it's a completely different company as a result and that's a result of one person working at a team level to begin to get it going and aaron bjork was the same person at microsoft these people did not ask permission. They they asked later for forgiveness, but there was no reason to forgive them because their teams were doing so well. So even just starting with with a good team, there isn't a transformation that can occur without at least one or two good teams that are doing this. And so, um, depending on you know the 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 transition where your organization is at this point in the transformation, um, and if you're just beginning, don't underestimate your capacity just as an individual to even to even transform large groups like these folks did um, moving on to the next question next we have uh, is it applicable to only product company or service company also in what ways uh, will it differ well sure i i mean i, I think um anytime you're trying to delight a client you're dealing with complexity. I mean, humans are complex. And um, in many cases, people don't know what will work for them until they've experienced something. I mean, this is why Steve Jobs refused to do customer surveys. Um, um, you know, we see this at Amazon with Jeff Bezos. He says, you cannot, you cannot put in a spreadsheet um, what, a, what a customer is going to experience. And so this is why we have these concepts of MVPs, or a minimum viable product, or a minimum marketable product. We go, we, we create something based on you know the feedback we have, um, the clients we're working with. We go out and we share that with with clients or or clients that are slightly different. 
And a service company, if a service company is going to grow and expand, it's the same thing. It's bringing the service offering out there. It's monitoring the feedback. It's it's easy to get net promoter scores after service engagements. Um, I know in the in the U.S. often if I bring my car in, um, I'll get a I'll get a little email text afterwards uh, after being serviced from the the shop, the um, dealer, and they'll say, um, you know, a scale of one to ten, how would you recommend our service uh, to uh, to a family member or friend or or something like that? And it takes me two seconds to to slide the bar or press the button on my phone to say, this is this is how uh, delighted I was. And and there's it, it's it's amazingly quick and early feedback for which we can bring that right back to our teams. We can say there's something going on going on here. Let's let's bring some folks in. Let's learn learn more about how to improve this this um, this um, you know customer experience. So services, products, software, hardware. Um, I don't I don't really think uh, it, it does not apply anywhere. I would say it applies in every case. Uh, well, we are heading towards the end of the session, Jay. So two more questions, and then we will uh, wrap up the session. Uh huh. Yeah. So next we have: uh, Can we follow Agile for legacy projects? Sure. You mean like legacy, like a legacy software development, where you're. You, so, um, so I I find in in legacy software pro, uh, projects. We have um, we have a combination of things going on, right? We have sort of a usually a support system going on, a ticketing system, and um, I like to do a modification on on ticketing uh, that looks more like a flow process, more like a kanban process, you know, like a like a help desk. You're prioritizing usually just by the time they come in, but then again, then you have some of those um, that that create requirements, right? On a legacy system, so you may be having repeated problems or and things that 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 will go into a development backlog. So, so depending on you know the way the teams organize on on those kinds of uh, legacies, I've seen modifications uh, from a pure Scrum to to more of a flow. But I don't like to get away from things like um, iterations. Even even if folks are are allowing requirements to flow through, like like on a um, support desk, um, I would still take a point and have the team reflect on how they're doing, how their processes are doing, how they're doing with each other in a retrospective. I really think of all of the uh, of the meetings, the um, so-called ceremonies and scrum, keep those retrospectives going. I find that people will drift away from those when they're they're in a more flow environment, and I, I, and I, and I, I think then the continuous improvement cycle uh, suffers. Okay, so we are taking the last question. How a Scrum Master who is responsible for project deliverables too creates self-organized, self-managed team with uh, tight project deadlines and time-based commitments? Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. When all, when, whenever possible. So most of the transformations I've done, coincidentally, have been with software service companies, and we've had to. We've had to um, educate the client uh, that for the client's benefit, um, they really don't want to operate on a um, uh, on a fixed bid basis. That that will be more expensive for them. And so there is some there is some opportunity, I believe, to to educate and and to convert um, where your requirements are coming from for people to appreciate the benefits and they should begin to see within us, you know, if you're delivering at every sprint, you're delivering something of value, they could, could quickly see the benefit of that over, over uh, some other sort of fixed um, schedule, fixed uh, bid um, requirement. And, and so I found I've had to go back uh, and kind of re re educate rework and that's optimal if you can do it. If not, you're you're you know you're just simply going to have some constraints that are suboptimal. But um, but I do think there's opportunity that that uh, if we can ask and we can educate and we can say to your for your benefit, we can improve these things uh, for you. Does that help? I think we're out of time, right? Yeah. Nelly. 
yes we are uh, like at the end of the session so thanks thanks jay for your time and this wonderful session it was such an insightful session and wonderful uh, piali thank you and your participants such a privilege to yeah. be with you today and a few more information for you friends so uh, attending this uh, webinar will earn you one seu under category a and one leadership pdu another information i would like to share with you all the annual conference of discuss agile network is scheduled on december 15th and 16th in bangalore it will be a multi theme conference uh, this time we have four tracks one is coaching and leadership another one is uh, kanban hybrid agile and uh, personal agility and uh, yes uh, this conference will give you 16 category a seus also so anybody who is interested in attending the conference please visit discussagile.com all the informations you will have on the website so that's all from my side i would like to thank jay once again and uh, thank you all for uh, joining this session our next webinar is scheduled on 10th of november that's uh, again on agile leadership so hope hope to see many of you on the next webinar as well thank you all good night